very cool moment for me was earlier this year I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. So for a lady telling me I can't walk from point A to point B unless I absolutely have to, and I have to wear a back brace and take painkillers, I took no painkillers, I took no medicine, and I did yoga, and then I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro no problem in January. So that was a pretty cool moment for me. I'm Heather Grish, and this is the Wisdom of the Body podcast. This podcast explores the idea of body intelligence as the real key to learning the knowledge of life, or what we call Ayurveda in the ancient language of Sanskrit. We do that by connecting with today's creative leaders and experts who will help you listen to your body, trust your gut, and live in deeper harmony with nature. Come join me as we unlock the golden door to clear direct perception and become very deep listeners. You can find the Wisdom of the Body podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can also follow us by joining my email at heathergrish.com or on Instagram at heathergrish. I know you're going to love this podcast, so take a second right now to subscribe. Do you have a personal project? I wanted to speak with my guest today because he's an inspiring artist who is a huge proponent of having a personal project to work on. In fact, this idea of having a personal project is something he speaks about all the time in different settings, including his TEDx Hanoi talk and on his own personal YouTube channel. He's been able to turn his creative passion, photography and photojournalism, into a living. And even though he's done a lot of commission jobs, weddings, and things that pay the bills, including being the star of a reality TV show in Asia, he's a huge fan of the personal project as an opportunity for learning and growth. One of the things I've observed in myself and others as we're going through what I'll call a healing journey is that we often end up feeling like we have two versions of ourselves. Actually, some people have even more than two versions they believe exist. I find that many people who have a quote-unquote job get the sense that they have two lives, one that they operate in to pay their bills, and this usually involves some kind of quote-unquote boss who pays them or controls their work, and another identity that they feel is their true identity, that they aren't able to be somehow in that setting where the boss has a say over their job. And I've observed this mechanism more in people with corporate jobs who really do have a boss but it also seems to happen to people you would expect to be their own boss, like an authority figure of some sort. The healing journey involves integrating all the disparate selves by denying that they exist and simply doing the work that is to be done in any given moment. I often feel that the work we do, whether it's something we're getting paid for or not, is a way that we are working ourselves out of some sort of karma in our life. Karma. Despite what popular culture has taught you about it, it isn't good or bad. The word karma simply means action in Sanskrit. So when I say that we are working ourselves out of our karmas, what I mean is that we are taking appropriate action. If we have a belief that we are someone, that will shape how we act. But if we believe that there is more than one of us, how will we get anywhere when they can't agree? So all of our work matters, but if we don't take the time to explore who we are without having a boss, will we ever really know who we are? The idea of having a personal project, as my guest suggests, is one such area where people can learn to know thyself and integrate all the disparate parts. My guest today also shares a really cool story about the healing power of yoga. You're going to love him. I'm here with wildlife photojournalist and documentary photographer Justin Mott. Justin is an award-winning photographer, and he's shot over 100 assignments for the New York Times, and a retrospective of his work that was photographed in Vietnam has been featured on the BBC. Additional major editorial clients include National Geographic, Smithsonian, The Washington Post, Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, Time, Greenpeace, The Guardian, among many others. Thank you so much for joining us, Justin. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. Well, I'm very excited to have you. And it's been a long time since we had a big, long chat. I'm excited to catch up with you today. Very long. Too long. Yeah. Probably 20 years. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, just kind of hit me. Time flies. My goodness. The days of living in San Francisco to now over a decade in Vietnam. (laughs) Wow, yeah, that's right. You've been there 10 years in Vietnam. 
Yeah, well, well, 13 coming on 14, I just oh. always say over a decade. Oh my god, amazing. When Vietnamese people ask me, I say under a decade because I don't speak the language well and it's embarrassing. <laughs> well, you've had an amazing career. You currently still have an amazing career as a wildlife photojournalist and a documentary photographer, although obviously we're in strange times right now. I'm sure your work has also been a bit disrupted, but I'm curious, how did you actually get into photography? Oh, it's a great question. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. I got into photography. I was living in San Francisco. I was going to school for journalism. I thought I wanted to be a writer. I have a very short attention span. I don't do well in a classroom environment and listening to lectures. And part of my sequence for, for writing was to take a photography class. And once I took that class, I never turned back because it got me outside of the classroom. I got to photograph different neighborhoods in San Francisco. I like to travel. I like to talk to people. I'm a very curious person. And so photography really opened up a whole new world to me. So wandering around the different neighborhoods of San Francisco, meeting different people from different backgrounds, doing interesting things and documenting their lives. I didn't know that could be a career. I didn't really know much of it. I was in my, let's see, mid to late 20s and bartending there and bartending, paying for school and going to school full time. It was tough, but I fell in love with photography when I got first camera and started taking those classes. And I never really looked back. I told myself, once I think about a couple of weeks into that, that class, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to make a living out of this. I don't care how I do it, how much I make or how long it takes. I'm just going to make it happen. And here I am, 42 years old, and I made it happen. And that's so amazing because so many of us have a creative passion that we kind of do on the side that we don't you know, do as a full-time job. But somehow you've actually been able to make a living with your creative passion. Yeah, I have. My sister always jokes with me. We just had a Zoom call the other day. She's like, I don't know where your confidence comes from because you have like irrational confidence. And maybe that's true. I don't know. I'm the youngest in my family. And I always just thought like, well, if I want to make this happen, I want to do something, I'm going to do it. And photography was a great creative outlet for me, something I'd been missing in my life in San Francisco, you know, going to bars, working at a bar, going to school. And I fell in love. I'm just that kind of person. I don't know if I'm going to be good at something, but I like to put myself out there. I don't mind making myself vulnerable. And I just sort of commit to things. And I really subscribe to the sort of hard work will pay off in the end. And it has. Now, what our audience doesn't know is that we used to be roommates in San Francisco. And I do remember, and you're, you know, the reason that I moved to San Francisco, because you already lived there and let me stay there with you. And I really observed living with you just how disciplined of a person you were. And I really still have this memory about you. And I would imagine that it takes a fair amount of discipline to build the kind of career that you have and vision as well. And you're highly accomplished in the work that you've done, but I know it probably, it didn't happen in a day and it took time to build. So I'd love to hear a little bit about the different kinds of work that you've done throughout the years in order to get where you are. Okay, yeah, I'm kind of a different photographer in, in that I do a lot of different things with my photography. When I decided that I would get into photography, it was in photojournalism. So I wanted to work for, for newspapers, magazines, things like that, and then do my own documentary work. But as my career sort of went on, I realized that it's tough to make a career in editorial work. And assignment work is sporadic, I would say. So the New York Times was sending me all over the place, and I was doing different jobs in Southeast Asia. But I realized I need to do other stuff as well, so I got into commercial photography. I mean, I do so many weird things with photography. I also run a destination wedding photography business. I don't do that myself anymore, but we run the business with my wife, and then we also run a production company. We shoot for hotels around the world, video for the hotels, photography for the hotels. We handle modeling and documentary work and my own personal projects. And then now here I am doing a project called Kindred Guardian. So it's basically doing a personal project that I hope to make into a book, hopefully several books. And I photograph people around the world who dedicate their lives to helping animals. And that sort of brings me up to date where I'm at now. But yeah, long period of my career, I was doing just assignment work for three times in Southeast Asia. And that just started by going to school and winning a couple of awards after school or during school. And then I just sort of moved to Vietnam open-ended and said, I'm going to make this work out here. You know, I watched your TED Talk in Hanoi and I was, you know, about doing a personal project and again, sort of 
along this theme of so many people do not follow the real passion that they have in life. And I'm kind of curious, how did this idea of having a personal project, how did this come up for you? Yeah, well, luckily, I learned a lot in school, and our professor at San Francisco State, it was lucky, it's a cheaper school to go to, but it happened to be one of the best schools for photojournalism, and I would like to say I did a bunch of research, and that's how I fell into that, but that's not really the case. I just fell into it because I was living in San Francisco, but our teacher happened to write only textbooks that I'm aware of about photojournalism, and he was very influential in my career. He encouraged us all to have a project. That's kind of how you build your portfolio. That's how you find your style in photography. And so he would tell us, you know, work on a project, work on something that you're passionate about. And for me, as I was getting older, like campus stories weren't interesting to me. I started doing stories around San Francisco, and then I traveled to Vietnam, and I decided to do a story about victims of Agent Orange. And, you know, Agent Orange is the chemical that the U.S. military dropped during the war, and it has its cause, you know, it seeped into the soil, and basically is causing, you know, disabilities in children that are being born still to this day after the Vietnam War. So I did a project on that after... Let's see, about within my first year out here. And yeah, that was just really important to me because I learned so much about the way I wanted to tell stories, the way I wanted to work creatively with my photography, trying different exposures. It just allowed me time. You know, in the real world, you don't have time to fail in your photography. You don't have time to practice your work so much. So I realized how important these were for a little growth period in my work creatively and how I could make mistakes and how I don't. And get away with it. You know, I can't make a mistake on an assignment for the New York Times. I can't experiment, really. I have to get the shots that I know how to get and tell the story the way I know how to tell the story. And I have to do it on a deadline. But personal projects became a way for me to experiment and a way for me to grow. And, yeah, that was how I really started my career. So I was lucky that my professor pushed me into that kind of work. I was lucky that, you know, I was bartending. I saved up a little bit of money. Went a little bit into debt as well when I moved out to Vietnam. And I just started working on the stories and working on my craft as a visual storyteller. You know, one of the things I remember really vividly from your TED Talk was something you said about, you know, you're talking about the great lengths that you'll go to get that beautiful light and that beautiful shot. And, you know, I'm not a photographer. I've taken pictures. You know, it's not something I can say that I'm really great at personally. But that idea of that beautiful light and that beautiful shot. And when I heard that, I said, well, how do you know when it's beautiful? Well, that's a great question. I've always been drawn to the beauty of natural light. You know, when I look around, just like to see where light falls with light casts, I started to understand that, you know, light can cause a mood in your photography, can sort of, it's like your canvas, you know, it's creating a mood and different times of the day. Obviously, the first hour of the day is beautiful light. The last hour of the day is beautiful light on, on people because it's coming from the side. It doesn't create these harsh shadows on people's faces. So I just started like making that my starting point in my photography. Like, where's the light falling? What do I want to capture within that light? And then putting it all together in my story. So I'm always waiting for beautiful moments within this beautiful light to tell my stories and to create my pictures. Okay, that just feels like a poem, the way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of patience. It's a lot of looking around. Like, It's also a curse in some ways, Heather, because... I can't walk into a room and not think about what time is the light going to fall into this room and where would my shot be? Where would people belong in this light? You know, cause I've always been into photographing people. Even my wildlife work is I'm not a traditional wildlife photographer. I'm a wildlife photojournalist, so I photograph people. So I'm always looking at where is the light going to fall and what's my picture within that light and what time am I going to have to be there to capture that? You know, that's actually a really great skill because I was over at a friend's house a couple of years ago, and she couldn't figure out why this plant was dying in her kitchen. And I just looked around the room and I saw where the sun was falling and realized that that plant was probably straight in the line of fire, you know, in the hot sun for a lot of the day. So I think this idea of seeing the light is probably also a really practical skill in addition to being so important to the work that you do. And as you say that, I'm looking around at all my plants. They're doing pretty well, but my wife takes care of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I give uh, light advice, but... <laughs> yeah. So this idea of light and beauty and seeing, obviously you're looking through a camera and you're doing that with your eyes. And because in Ayurveda, one of the things that we do, Ayurvedic medicine, is to help people care for their organs of sensing so the organs of sensing, including the ears, the skin, the eyes, the tongue, and the nose that are involved in detecting 
the environment around us. One of the things I'm fascinated by is how we use our sense organs when we're doing our work in the world. And so you're looking through the camera a lot with your eyes. The chef is using the nose and the tongue a lot to do his work. The musician is using her ears. You know, everybody's pretty much using their eyes all day long on Zoom now. And I was having some headshots taken, some photographs taken of me by someone earlier this year before my book launch, and this was all before the pandemic. And I recall noticing the look in her eyes. So the photographer's eyes just stood out to me so much. They were so focused and almost (laughs) trance-like. And I started to wonder, do you need really great vision to be a photographer? (laughs) <laughs> well, it's a great question, but I do happen to have really great vision. I have had it for a long time. I don't want to jinx it, so I'm not going to wood, but I'm actually the kind of person. The short answer is no, I don't think you do. I just happen to have good vision. I have several friends who wear glasses who have horrible vision, and they can make it work. For me, I shoot with a manual camera, so I manual focus. I'm lucky to have good vision. I am that annoying person at the doctors who, once you've passed the test in 2020 vision, I tell them to go farther down the chart just to show off and see how far see what I can see. (laughs) I think that's going to deteriorate because I look at screen so much in my life, but I happen to have good vision, but I don't think you need to have good, you know, like normal optical vision, but you need to have a vision on what you're trying to capture. And it's more important, the vision of how you see things. You know, I think that's so important as a photographer. It's not how clearly it is. It's just putting yourself into the scene. What do you see and how do you see it? What do you decide to capture? What do you decide not to capture? That's the most important thing is finding a style, being comfortable with that style and confident enough to say, oh, that's a picture, right? There's a picture. Or this will be a picture if I come here at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Or if I come here at, uh, you know, the next day. Or I wait a couple days when there's no cloud cover and the light comes to light. You have to have a little bit of a vision in that way is to look ahead and then be patient and then execute that. And it does take time. And honestly, in my normal work, I don't have time to do that. And I'll always say the importance of a personal project is I'm finally giving myself time to do that. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to allow myself to go back tomorrow and get the shot that I need to get. Or I'm going to follow this person with their permission for a week, you know, and shadow them with my camera. And as uncomfortable as that may be, you know, I'm hoping to get these natural moments as they unfold within the light that I want to tell the story that that's the truth. That's really interesting because as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing something that you had said earlier about, you know, observing the moments. So When you're doing certain projects, are the projects more kind of organized and orchestrated? And then when you're working on your creative projects, it's more like you're waiting for a moment to happen? Yeah, well, for example, if I did an assignment for the New York Times, let's say, you know, I'm in Vietnam and let's say I had a story to do in, you know, in Myanmar, a travel story. And I might have a list of things a writer wants me to capture. I might get a little bit of creative freedom of my editor to to sort of capture some other things outside this, but I've got a finite number of time. I need to get this stuff done. So I have this list. I've got a couple, you know, maybe it's, they pay you per day. So they try to cram in as many things as they can, the shortest amount of time as they can. So in those situations, I feel like I'm using my past creativity because I have to go there. I have to get these shots the way I know how to get them and then deliver and then stories published. And then with my personal project, I have time to actually to think a bit and wait and look around and I can pick the stories that I'm passionate about. And my personal projects are are a statement about who I am creatively or who I am as a photographer or an artist or more so as a documentary photographer. So it's I pick stories that I know I'll be able to get the kind of shots that I want to get. And I'm very meticulous about it. I talk to people. I'm a pain in the butt, you know, because I'm constantly emailing them and contacting them. And, you know, it's funny because I'm asking them for permission, but I've got all these rules because I need stories that I can get close to people that get close to animals. I need stories that people get close to the animals so I can capture those intimate moments. And also important, I need stories that if they do get close to the animals, I need to make sure it's in an ethical way. You know, if they're getting close to an animal, and treating it more like a pet and it's supposed to be released in the wild, they're not the right subject for me. Or if it looks the wrong way, I have to be sure about how I capture that and how I put that into my story and how that's presented so it's not taken out of context. So my project's quite quite complicated in that way because, you know, I'm getting close to rhinos, I'm getting close to gibbons and animals that the average person shouldn't be getting close to, but these just happen to be circumstances that make sense for humans to get close to these animals. So it makes it quite difficult. So I have to do a lot of research ahead of time. And then I have to allow myself a lot of time on the ground when I get there. But it's great. It's the beauty of a self-funded project. I don't have to answer to anybody. 
you know, I can do it my way. I publish these stories afterwards sometimes, but they don't get published. I'm also okay with that because they all feed into the larger part of my project. It's not your project, Kindred Guardians. It sounds like it's focused on the people caring for the endangered animals. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. I've always admired people that sort of dedicate their life to helping animals. It's always something I've wanted to do. It's something I've sort of hid from in Vietnam. It's a very cruel society to animals here. You know, you see a lot of animals being slaughtered. You see, you know, a lot of markets where animals are there to be. And it's very raw and in your face. It happens in America. It's just behind closed doors. But there's the rhino horn industry here. There's a lot of traditional medicine and things like that, and you know, bear bile, stories like that. I, I was a little bit of a coward for stories like that. They'd make me so sad, and make me really angry, and I always felt like I got enough of that. At the time, I got enough of that in my other work as a photojournalist, covering a lot of tragedy, but some things that were pretty awful to see. But yeah, now I realize like, I care about this. I'm inspired by these people. I want to document these people, and that's what I'm going to go after, is I, I look for these great stories, these inspiring stories that really showcase sort of the best of people and it also shows the worst of people because their animals are in these situations. But it's been quite a wonderful turnaround in my career this past year doing this project. It's been very, very fulfilling. And it's kind of why I got into photography in the first place is to tell stories that I'm really passionate about. And I know that you are a very disciplined person. And you were talking earlier about vision and, you know, having that vision, that sort of creative vision to see something or catch the moment so I know that there's a fair amount of organization that goes into having that vision, though, and a fair amount of discipline that goes into it, because in all of our work, you know, there's unpredictability. And with you, there's unpredictability of nature and weather and probably things like that. There's so many things outside of your control. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the processes, maybe a day in the life example of how you kind of set your vision and then execute your process to realize that vision? Yeah, well, great question. I'd like to say I'm disciplined in my work, but I feel like you have a finite amount of, you know, discipline memory if I'm equating it to something with uh, photography. Like you have a memory card and you only have so much discipline. I put all of that into my photography and growth and marketing my work and telling stories. But it's also made me not so disciplined in my, my diet and exercise. I'm very sporadic. I probably travel three weeks out of the month. I'm on the road. So it makes it hard to get into sort of any routine, you know, mentally and physically. That's been hard, and it's been a struggle for about a decade for me. But when it comes to my personal work, the discipline, I've always been that kind of person that just says, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make it happen, and I'm going to announce it. I like to hold myself accountable, so I get discipline through accountability, which is basically I announce to the world, I'm going to have an exhibition, or I'm going to launch this project, Kindred Guardians, and then I'm going to email someone right away. And I'm very whimsical that way and say, okay, I want to photograph the last northern, the last... Uh, Northern white rhinos in the world, and I want access to that. And you know, I'll start this conversation. I'll book a ticket and go when I have time in between my commercial photography. So I'm whimsical, but I'm also disciplined in that I announce it and I'm going to do it. And I just make sure that I do it by booking tickets or you know arranging a, you know exhibition and saying, okay, this date I'm going to have this. Or I'm going to show my work on this time, or I'm going to launch my book at this point. So. I kind of just hold myself accountable by announcing things to the world through social media. <laughs> if you want to create a more receptive body, free from toxins, inflammation, and metabolic issues, either for yourself or because you're considering trying to get pregnant, would it be crazy for you to explore booking a virtual Ayurvedic consultation with me? There's probably never been a more perfect time to do it. Every day you wait matters. So if you're ready to get your body back in balance, I'll give you a 30-day plan to get you started. Go to heathergrish.com to book a consultation. That's heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H dot com. I love that. And, you know, you brought up earlier about how it's not always difficult to take care of yourself and all that. And it is funny how we as humans can be so disciplined and so on top of things in one area and then struggle in another area, namely our bodies and not taking care of our bodies. And I know that yeah. you struggled a little bit with some pain in recent years and that you've had some experience with yoga in that healing process. Do you want to talk about that a little? Sure. Yeah. I mean, my body must be so confused by who I am because I'll be on the road for like, you know, a week straight and I'm getting up at 4.30 and I'm on my feet the entire day. And then I come back to Hanoi and I'm editing and I'm not moving at all. I'm sitting at a desk and I'm not doing anything. So it's like, who are we? What are we doing this week? Are we being active or are we not being active? So I never really get into 
any sort of groove. Like I mentioned a little before, I'll, I'll fluctuate weight. You know, I'll put on 20 pounds and I'll lose 20 pounds. And I'll put it back on again. It's been quite hard for me to get anything consistent that way. Or I'll exercise. I'll be so ex- extremely disciplined in my exercise. And then I'll go off of that for a week. And then I hurt myself. I hurt my back. I slipped a disc. It was a minor injury at first. I was jumping off of a little boat into the water in Cambodia, and I, maybe in my early 30s. I was on a New York Times travel assignment. I sort of tweaked my back, and then about, let's say, seven or eight years later, I was shooting a commercial shoot for Intercontinental Hotels in Australia, and I have an assistant who's quite agile and a lot younger than me. He jumped over this little fountain, if you can imagine, and I thought this was a cool little spot that I could get to, and he said, oh, I'll go back and take a look, and he jumped over it easily, and I thought, oh, I could make that jump. He's a lot smaller than me. (laughs) Maybe I thought because I was taller I could make it. But I did land the jump, and my right foot slipped down on the marble. And this was all trying to get, like, this beautiful shot through this fountain back into the lobby. It wasn't even a shot on my list. It was, like, me trying to go above and beyond for my client. And I I hope they appreciate it, but I never got that shot. (laughs) But I slipped on the marble. My right, my left knee smashed into sort of the edge of the marble, and it cut all the way down to the bone. I tried to do that macho thing where I was pretending like I was fine. I did feel fine for a second. I stood up. I looked down. I thought it was just water, but my leg was bleeding pretty badly, so I didn't want to be gruesome. But I was brought to the hospital. I partially tore my patella, my MCL, and a tiny fracture. I didn't even have to have surgery, but through that, I was in a wheelchair for about, let's say, two months with my leg in a cast. And while I was moving around, that back injury came back sort of full force. And so while I'm out you know, on one leg wheeling around. I still worked. I actually finished the shoot that day because it was a very expensive shoot for the client. There was a lot at stake. We had models. We had flown a really long way. So I finished my shoot in a wheelchair. We flew to Dubai afterwards and did the second part of the shoot. So my client appreciated that. My wife maybe didn't appreciate it so much because she's a producer and we work together. We go and shoot together. But she helped me a lot through that time. But yeah, while I was in the wheelchair, my back really sort of fully went out. I had it checked out. I had a really, really bad slip disc. The doctor in Vietnam told me, oh, take a bunch of medicine and painkillers and wear a back brace. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, forever? <laughs> She's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, but what about, like, I need to walk around? She's like, well, you can go for walks that you need to get to a place, point A to point B, but don't go for walks. And I'm like, but I love my walks, and I like to exercise, and I like to lift weights, and I like to do all these things. And it was just kind of a, like, doctors here can be like that. They're just very, like, well, that's it. And she was maybe a little bit old school in her thinking. So I went to Singapore. I got a second opinion. The doctor there was pretty short with me. He said, listen, you can have pretty pretty awful invasive surgery where they move cartilage and put it there. And it's risky and it's very invasive, but why don't you try yoga for three months? And I said, yeah, that sounds a lot better than this. So I tried yoga. I got a personal teacher that would come to my house. I have a little gym at my house and I've worked with her for years and it all went away. Not all of it, but here, I, a very cool moment for me was earlier this year, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. So for a lady telling me I can't walk from point A to point B unless I, unless I absolutely have to, and I have to wear a back brace and take painkillers, I took no, no painkillers, I took no medicine, and I did yoga, and then I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro no problem in January. So that was a pretty cool moment for me after all that work. It was a lot of hard work, but you know, yoga, I, I've come to fully enjoy it, and I, it helps me a lot with my, with my work. I still have a little bit of back pain from time to time, but Nothing like what it used to be. So I'm really glad I got a second opinion. And I'm glad that I was very proactive in not taking medication and just handling it myself with something that could be handled that way. I am so amazed. <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea that the injury was that bad. And I remember you had reached out to me inquiring about, you know, what to look for in a yoga teacher. Obviously, me being in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, I was not going to be able to teach you yoga. <laughs> But, you know, I could help you at least look for the qualities of a good teacher. And I just find that to be so amazing. You know, we occasionally hear these amazing stories about a person who's had a very painful and serious injury. And it looks like all hope is lost and that the person's going to be in, you know, dire straits the rest of his life. And you really are one of those miracle stories. And it's all because of your care and your attention that you've given to your body. I'm so amazed. So tell us a little bit about your yoga practice. Well, so it really started after that doctor told me, gave me that option of like, try yoga for a few months and come back to me if it still hurts. And luckily I've never seen that guy again in my life. But I looked for a teacher online. I prefer one-on-one classes. And I thought with my injury, I should have someone that can really teach me and make my class sort of catered around my problems. 
And so, you know, when I have pain, I'm not just like stopping at a class because I can't do an exercise. We're doing other exercises or we're strengthening my core more because that's important to working around the back. I started to notice with your lower back, when you start to work around it, you get all these other injuries because you're compensating somewhere else. So I started to have sciatic nerve pain. She worked a little bit with doctors, but she's she didn't know a lot about that kind of stuff, but she was very good at just like, she knows yoga and she knows the moves and she knows what my problems were. And we just worked, it was kind of like the two of us figuring out together, you know, because she had worked with some people lower back pain, but I wouldn't say she's an expert on the lower back, but yeah, she was great. She's wonderful. She comes to my house. We do a few times a week. In the beginning, I just did it by myself because I thought I would cater it around my injuries. And I thought if my wife was there, then again, she, you know, would be sort of a different class that she might not be interested in. But now after about a year of doing it, just the two of us now, my wife joins the classes together. So it's a nice way for us to start our day. Our office is on the second floor of our building. So it's kind of nice. We get up in the morning. We do a couple times a week. She'll come here. We'll do the class together for about an hour, an hour straight. And yeah, it feels great. And I can't go without it now. It's not even like, I enjoy it thoroughly, but I can't even imagine going like a few weeks without it. It's not possible because I can't go back to that pain anymore. I have a pretty high threshold for pain, I think, but the sciatic nerve pain was just so uncomfortable. You know, I'm flying all the time. I'm in buses. I'm in planes. I was a TV host for several years. <laughs> and so I was flying all over the place with this pain and I would have to sit in these sort of awkward positions <laughs> all the time on the plane. And then I'd have to like, you know, get up and be ready to be filmed and run around because it's a reality show about photography. So I'd like, I'd be a judge in a suit and then I'd have to run over and do these other competitions where I compete against these amateur photographers. I'd have to like run full speed. So yeah, it did change me a lot. Like after I did all this and really became disciplined in it and then just make sure that when I'm on the road, I just stretch as much as I can. I just do a couple moves and I travel and I have like a Peloton app and I do yoga classes there. Or I just go through the moves that I know from the class that work you know, the best way, the most efficient for me. Changed my life, though. That's amazing. Yeah, and I learned to teach yoga. I studied to teach yoga about 10 years ago, and then for a while I was teaching yoga, and I was teaching yoga teachers. And I remember when I first started practicing yoga, which was years before that, that I could not remember the poses in the beginning. And I really <laughs> did need, you know, really intense training in order to even just be able to remember a lot of them. I would get kind of, like, scared, like, wait, I could move my body that way? What? And I love how <laughs> you went through this process of just really getting to know your body, it sounds like, through this healing that you did. Yeah, I did. And it's funny, too, because I think a lot of people get caught up in, I'm very competitive. I used to, like, I used to love playing basketball and I was never good at any of these things, but I like to compete. I was always very, like, yoga, I wanted to make it competitive and I get mad at myself for not being able to, you know, reach certain points. But I just became okay with, I don't know when this happened or how it happened, but I became okay with like, listen, I'm not that flexible. And I like, it takes a long time for me to see progress. And even when I'm losing weight, I go on a full diet. And, you know, I, it takes a long time for anything to happen with my body. I'm just not built that way. But I just became okay with, I feel good doing this, during it, and then afterwards. And I just always have to remind myself of that pain. I always have to remind myself of the alternative, which was this invasive surgery or, you know, having a life addicted to painkillers, which is not what I like to do. I don't like to take medicine unless I absolutely have to. So I just didn't want to live that life, and I'm glad that I chose this, and I'm glad it worked. You know, a lot of times you think, well, okay, this isn't going to work. How is yoga going to fix this slip this? But it really has, and, you know, it's so important for me to be able to be on my feet. When I'm a photographer, I'm constantly lying on the ground. People are looking at me funny all the time. I'm getting my best pictures when I'm rolling around on the dirt or on the ground, you know, <laughs> or on the tarmac or wherever I'm at, like I'm climbing trees and things like that. I'm a big guy and I haven't lost a lot of weight doing this, but I've just had to be okay with, listen, I'm healthier than I was before. I'm stronger than I was before. And most importantly, I'm happier than I was before. Okay. So I wrote in my book, The Ayurvedic Guide to Fertility, about there are these factors that contribute to any creative endeavor coming to fruition. And obviously, like I wrote a fertility book, so it's about, you know, creating people, but any of these factors can be applied to any creative project. And one of these factors has to do with timing. So it's, you know, making sure that the timing is right for something or just being there at the right moment. So can you think of one example in your life or in your work that comes to mind where we say that timing is everything when it comes to creative work? Oh, timing is everything when it comes to creative work. <laughs> yeah, you know, I could think of interesting things like, for example, I don't know if this falls in, but like, so doing my injury gave me time to actually think, <laughs> right? So that injury came at a time where I was really running around like crazy in my commercial work, you know, traveling to all these different countries, working 
two weeks straight, crazy hours, not sleeping a lot, not taking care of my body. And, you know, sometimes these injuries, I think, happen for a reason, because after that, it gave me time to think about my body, to understand my body more, pay attention to my overall health, but also made me pay attention to my mind to like, what am I doing in my career? What's my legacy? I started my career in documentary work, doing meaningful work. And okay, not that, you know, I know hotels aren't really meaningful, they pay the bills, but I started to think, why have I strayed so far from that? What happened to these stories that I'm passionate about? What happened to that energy for going for these stories? And you know, that gave me time, that sort of planted the seed in my mind, because it was one of the few times because I couldn't run around as much as I used to. So I had time to think about what I wanted to do in my future. I had time to think about the kind of projects, what I wanted to do with my photography, you know, and really start to make a plan. It didn't happen that quickly, but it did give me time to think. And that had sort of led to me starting this project, which has led to me, you know, falling in love with photography again and storytelling again. And finding a project like this is such a cool project for me because it's so open-ended. It's like a lot of photographers do a project that lasts a year or, or maybe a few months, but this, I can't see it ending for me because there's so many stories of these amazing people doing these things. And it's just so fun. It's it sparked me creatively again. So timing for me, that injury did come at a good time because I think I would have got totally burnt out. And I don't know if I ever would have taken the time to actually think about, all right, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing more important with my photography? How am I going to remember it? Am I going to remember from my hotel photography? Like, okay, that's not what I want to be remembered for. Like, I want to be remembered for what, why I got into this work in the first place is to make it different with your images, to make open up this world to people, raise awareness for things you're interested in and raise awareness for issues that need awareness and attention on. And so that's where I'm kind of my focus. So that timing was kind of perfect for me in a way. Yeah. A little bit delayed, but it was perfect. Yeah. And it also sounds like, you know, there won't be an end to animals being endangered. And yeah. I'd love to hear, you know, is there a moment or an animal or a caretaker that when you think of why you do this work and the difference that a person is able to make through that work, is there something that comes to mind that you could share? Yeah, quite an interesting, a very powerful moment for me in this project was, you know, when I first went to Old Pajetta, which is the conservation that has the last two northern white rhinos left in the entire world. So there's only two left. They're both female. That's how I launched this project. That was the first story I wanted to do. It's a tough story to get access to. It's in central Kenya. A lot of photographers have done the story before. A lot of videographers, filmmakers have done the story. I thought it'd be a great way to launch this project because it's just one small part of a bigger project for me. But the interesting sort of full circle for me was years before that, about a decade before that, I did an assignment for Time Magazine. I also was commissioned by the United Nations to do a story on the illegal wildlife trade here and more specifically the rhino horn trade. So you know, years ago, I did the story where I actually had to go undercover and pretend to be a buyer at a black market rhino dealer. So he's dealing these horns, and I walk into this place, and it was disgusting just to see, you know, elephant tusks, tiger bones, and I actually had to drink rhino horn because I had to pretend to be a buyer. So I'm in this guy's little place in a little tiny, like, a uh, lair, I would say, <laughs> behind this little food shop in Hanoi, and just seeing that world and opening up that world to me and how disgusting it was and how horrific and it was risky as well, but, you know, and I actually held that rhino horn in my hand. So there I am holding a severed rhino horn. And now 10 years go by, and then there I am in Opa Jedi. I come up, I, I started this project, a new point in my life, and, you know, a huge point in my life, starting something new again. So I was very excited about, and then to get up close and personal and to be able to touch the horn of a live rhino, it was very emotional. It was sort of a mixed feeling because I'm so sad that this is the state they're in because of, you know, people like this that are consuming rhino horn, which I should also note that, you know, it doesn't do anything. I think people know that by now, but people are still consuming it. It's the same, made up of the same material as hair and fingernails, but it's still consumed a lot in Vietnam, China, South Korea, a lot of different countries. But there I was, like, you know, up close and personal with these two rhinos might go extinct within our lifetime. Hopefully not. They're still trying a procedure that I hope pays off, and I've been documenting that as well. But it was a very emotional time for me to be there. And, you know, going from 10 years ago, holding a severed rhino horn, and then here I am, starting this project and seeing a rhino up close and personal and, you know, saying to myself, why did it take so long for me to get here to start this project? I should have been doing this a long time ago. And that turned into meeting Zachariah, which is the head caretaker of Tuna Jean. They're mother and daughter rhinos, and they're both female, so they're still trying to artificial insemination. They're trying a procedure. It's very expensive, very difficult. But meeting Zachariah, seeing his care for the animals, and, you know, it's quite fascinating to me and documenting his life for about two weeks there and getting to know him and calling him a friend now. I've been back there twice. I hope to go back again later this year if things open up. 
But yeah, it's so special to watch this person. It's so inspiring to me. I mean, he spends more time with these rhinos than he does his own family. They sort of live in like a campsite there for 21 days on and then six days off where he travels a few hours to see his family and then he comes back for 21 days on. And then in addition to that, the rangers that protect them and that protect the conservancy, they're also protecting all the wild animals there as well. And those guys, meeting those guys and shadowing them for a couple of days, that was part of my project, you know, going out in the middle of the jungle with their guns and having to ward off potential poachers, but also they're out there with dangerous predators, you know, lions and you know, hippos and elephants and rhinos are quite dangerous animals for humans. So these guys are out there risking their lives. And another powerful moment for me was, I know you asked me for one, but this one will be quick. The other powerful moment was one of the rangers that I met. He had about a year before this, he was telling me a story. He opened up a little bit to me. And he had actually been in a firefight with three poachers that were going after a rhino. They fired upon him and in self-defense, he killed three men. You know, I mean, this guy's in his mid twenties and he's literally risking his life in the way that people just uh, throw out there. He, fired upon and then he has to live with he had to kill three people you know justified but still he had to in self-defense kill three other human beings that were trying to kill a rhino it's crazy wow it's all enough to make you want to become a vegetarian huh yeah i've been a vegetarian for a long time and i've recently become vegan and i feel really good about it <laughs> i actually didn't know that i was kind of kidding but yeah it sort of fits okay so yeah. justin i wasn't planning on asking you about this but you brought it up how the heck did you find yourself as a reality TV star in Asia? <laughs> it's a weird little part of my career. Like, I don't know if I should always put it into my bio or not, because my career is really hard for most people to digest without that. But I don't look the part. You know, I'm a bearded, bald, fat dude, and <laughs> middle-aged white guy. But a friend of mine owns a production company, and he said the History Channel Asia was doing this uh, reality show about photography, sponsored by Canon. And he said, Justin would be great for this. He shoots everything. He's a photographer that does everything. So I had no experience in television at all at the time. And he just said, he's a silly guy. And I can be very silly and, and very serious. <laughs> but I'm usually pretty silly, as you know. And basically, I had no idea what to expect of this. But being like the irrational confidence person that I am, I said, yeah, why not? I think I could do it. I can do it well. Let me try it. So I always subscribe to that. Like if it scares you a little bit in your stomach, go for it. You know, because those are the things you remember in life. If it gives you that little pit in your stomach, go for it. So they asked me as a photographer in the region because the show was going to cover all of Southeast Asia. And I think they thought no photographers would go for this because the premise of the TV show was a professional photographer who goes up against amateurs. So I could look really bad, but I thought, well, I'm not going to lose. I'm going to beat all these photographers. I'm, of course I am. I do everything and I've been doing it for a long time. But that was the premise of the show. And I was so stupid the first year. I didn't really even know that I was the star of the show until they came out with like a bus promo. And it was, like my face was on a bus. It was on a giant billboard in Singapore, <laughs> it just kind of steamrolled into, look, I'm the face of the show. This is funny. And being Singaporean, very open how they are, they told me, listen, we thought in your bio picture, you had a lot of hair and you looked very fit. And then we saw your video and we thought, oh, you're fat and you don't look as handsome as we thought, but you were really funny. So we decided to go with you. And I thought, you could have just <laughs> told me you liked my audition. You didn't have to tell me the other part, but thanks. <laughs> oh my God. That's the honesty you live with in, in Asia all the time. It happens to me in Vietnam <laughs> Yes, you put on weight. Yes, you're fat now. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, wow. I have thick skin, so it's okay. But it was funny. So I, there I was, thought I'd do the show for a bit. It turned into like this, you know, three-month filming in six different countries a year. I thought it might be one season, two seasons, and it turned into five seasons. Uh, I traveled around and did these like sort of, you know, history has this like history con thing, which is like Comic-Con, but for History Channel people. And, you know, I did that for two years and the show for five years. And yeah, it was a trip, but I will say it was a fun experience, but it also, that time I could have been using to do this personal project. I look back and I think I probably should have cut it a couple years earlier, so I should have, could have started this project a little bit earlier, but it was fun for a bit. It just wasn't intellectually or creatively that fulfilling, but it was a fun, fun part of my life and an interesting experience. Yeah, and it is interesting how we never know how the things that we've done in our life will sort of come back and serve either us or someone else in some other way later who knows you know someone might remember you on that show and that'll turn into <laughs> some opportunity yeah, yeah. right well that's yeah, awesome yeah, it's been funny. i yeah. was mean on the show that was the bad thing about the show i became this like fake persona because i needed to be because everyone was so nice on the show and you needed a villain so i became the villain so then i'd meet people in person and they would say oh you're a lot nicer we thought you were going to be a jerk <laughs> Oh, my God. I could pretty much attest to the fact that you are not a villain. Thank you. I've lived with you. 
<laughs> I was on the show. The show released my villain. So don't always believe everything. Oh, came okay. Out on TV. <laughs> yeah, totally. I made oh people my God. cry. I feel bad. <laughs> oh, you did? Wow. I wasn't like, I'm not a screamer or yeller. I would just be, what they told me was like, just be honest about your thoughts about the pictures and as a judge. And I needed to build up this, like, because they got a chance to beat me. So I needed to build up that tension. <laughs> I love it. Lots of honesty going on here. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Justin, this has been so great having this conversation with you, catching up after so many years that we've not spoken. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining the Wisdom of the Body podcast. And I'd love for you to tell the listeners how they can find you and learn more about your work. Oh, well, first of all, thank you and thank your audience for listening to me ramble on about my career and my life here. But you can find my work on very active on Instagram, and my handle is just askmott, A-S-K-M-O-T-T. -T. Mott's my last name. My website is justinmott.com, and I'm pretty active on YouTube now, too, vlogging, and I'm going to start got this whole kit to vlog and start to do these stories, behind-the-scenes stories of my project, so you'll get to meet all these different animals and see the people that take care of them. In addition to my photos, I'll be doing these great behind-the-scenes videos, and that's on youtube.com slash askmott. Everything is basically askmott, A-S-K-M-O-T-T. -T. Thank you. Yeah, and I really recommend checking Justin out because you'll experience a whole range of emotions from him touching your heart <laughs> with some creative project he's working on to just making you laugh your ass off. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for tuning in and dropping in with us today. Follow me on social media and see if you'd like to go deeper. You can find me on Instagram at Heather Grish. That's at Heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H. If you're ready to go deeper, then stop by my website if you want to explore booking a consultation. And meet me here next time on the Wisdom of the Body podcast. <laughs>